and you wanted them to contact you when things are happening. Uh, what I did was there's always at least one public phone booth in a in a on our original community. A lot of, not a lot of them have in those going back a few years. Not a lot of them had private phones and landlines. There's quite a few now have mobile. But I used to go through all the communities with a big black marker pen and write uh, contact Tony Cost, they all sort of all knew who I was. Contact Tony Cost, and I put the Australian newspaper's 013 number so they could bring me for free from anywhere in Australia. And um, and that was really good. And every time I visited the community, I went and visited the phone box to make sure it was still there. They had no one had rubbed it out. But um, when dealing with contacts is something that is that yeah, we could talk about, we should talk about for an entire day because um, it, I mean, you can't get by without contacts. Um, a journalist is only as good as his or her contact book or contact list. And, um, and uh, you know, you've got to look out for contacts. The biggest thing, I think, with contacts is that people that you deal with have to be convinced, one, that you'll, you'll keep, their, keep their confidentiality, you won't you won't reveal who they are who's telling you stuff. And also you've got to have their respect as, as, a, as a journalist who'll do the right thing by the information they give you. Um, and uh, you just have to be sensible about it. I mean, it's, it's a really good one these days with the, with the coffee epidemic, if you like, around here. I meet so many people in coffee shops, you know, but before you used to either come to the office or you'd be worried when meet them on a pub or a park or somewhere. But now it's really easy and quite socially acceptable to be seen with somebody having a coffee in any of five million places in Brisbane or wherever. Um, but, and it's also, I mean, when, when Milton Peterson, who was the Premier, when he, um, left politics. I had 16 phone numbers for him because often you, know, you had to get him at night and there was only landlines. So there all these different places where he might be or people who, who knew who he was. But le these days with mobile phones and, and uh, uh, Facebook and everything else, it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to actually get in touch with people. Um, but contacts, contacts are fantastic. You just got to treat them properly. Never rat on them. Never uh, make a commitment or a promise if you can't keep, or if you, if you find you can't keep them, get on, get in and explain them. And um, and trace of them, you know, contacts and just everything. I, I've still got my. I used to rewrite my contact book. I suppose people do it electronically now, but I'd be terrified about losing it. But I used to rewrite it every January. Of course, the ones have died, and I've still got all my old ones from 20 years ago. But um, yeah, I, I, I just think you treat, treat contacts with respect. And also, I mean, there are different grades of contacts. Right? Some people just roll of gold, some people that you know really well, that you would trust with them. And if they told you something, you wouldn't even bother checking it, you'd just write it more than you go because you knew that what they told you was right. And there are some shady ones. I mean, you often ask yourself, why is this person telling me this? Why they don't, you know, it's not going to be beneficial to them. You know, it's actually harmful to their political party or whatever. Uh, and they're doing it out of spite or malice or something. It, it often didn't worry me what their motive was. Uh, but I like to know what it was. I like to be able to work it out. And, uh, the, uh, there were some people who ring you. I had a police woman who used to do rang me anonymously for five years with great stuff. I know she worked in the Fortitude Valley Station. I never met her. I never knew her right name. She never gave me her number to contact her. She used to ring me and she'd give me stuff which was gold every time. I have no idea who she is, where she is. She never got back in touch and it was real. But I used to love getting a call from her. Um, and then and uh, and you get people like Al Bianca you know, and the Premier. I mean, they all linked here, but I remember this one night here, the two ministers who were playing up and he wanted to get rid of them. And it was a Sunday night at the Korea Mail and the phone rang of the senior political reporter, Peter Morley, and I, he wasn't on, but I was, I picked up. 
and I just said, Courier Mail, and he said, but who, who's that? And I knew who it was straight away because that's the way he used to speak with me. And, uh, and I said, it's Tony Christ. And he said, I, I, he thought I'd run Country Life because I'd been there. And I said, oh, no, I'm with the Korean now. He said, oh, I'm good, typical Tony. He said, no, about Vic Sullivan and, and uh, the other fellow's name, Tompkins, Ken Tompkins, because there was a lot of speculation they get sacked. I said, yes, Premier. He said, um, well, I think if you write a speculative story that they're going to be sacked from Cabinet this week, and if you attribute it to a senior government source, I said, thank you, Premier, and do it. And that was it. I mean, that's, you don't get a more senior government source than that when the Premier's saying, you're going to sack to you later. And, um, but I, I could go on all day about contests, good ones and bad ones, and, and funny ways that they get in touch with you. And, but I'd love to be starting my career now like you are, with things like social media and, and mobile phones and all that. The only thing work some contacts here now. But um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. When you ring up somebody, cold call them, you never spoken to them before. How do you introduce yourself and, and persuade them to be willing to talk to you? Yeah? They, well, might, they, may not, they might not be too happy to talk <coughs> well, to the you media. Have to be, you have to be a good bullshit ass and all that regard. But the thing is, I mean, ethically, you've got to disclose who you are and who you work for. The only, the only um, one that I, I was a bit shady with was um, when I worked for the Courier Mail and I started doing all the indigenous stuff, I was blown away by how cooperative Indigenous people who didn't know me were with me. And because uh, I'd ring them up and tell them, and there was a, there was a mob who used to handle all the Indigenous funding then called ATSIC. And I was right up on, and, uh, because of the waste of money. And, but I couldn't believe how, how even their councillors and all would be helpful to me and give me great quotes and detail. And I used to ring up and I'd say, oh, hi, hello, Ray Robin, it's Tony Cossie at the Korean Mark. What I didn't realise, or I didn't realise for a little while, was their Indigenous people have made a newspaper in New South Wales, it's called the Koori Mail. The Koori means in Aboriginal up there, what they call Murrays in Queensland, the Koori's down there. And I was thinking I was from the Koori Mail, their own newspaper, and I was from the Koori Mail. And, and I, I, I just, I spoke too quickly and slurred anyway, but and it took me six months because I had to have him ringing up the next week and saying, who are you quoting me? I didn't talk to you. You're the Courier Mail, you know. I say, yes, you did, mate. I spoke to you on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock and you gave me that quote. Oh, there's no way in the world I'd ever speak to the Courier Mail. And then I, yeah, then the penny drop. They thought I was the You're the Courier Mail. Mail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you got the story. But no, you just, I mean, everybody's different. I mean, anybody here. You can imagine if you got a phone call from me and I want to know something about your family or I want to, you know, if your brother got killed in Afghanistan and I want you to give me the photo or whatever like that. I mean, you'd all be suspicious of me and everything. And I'd, I'd have to work like hell, as you would, to convince you that I was going to be straight and treated properly and appropriately. And, and, um, and I found over the last five, ten years the greatest thing is the coffee shop because it's a, it's a, um, it's non-threatening. It's not like you know I'll meet you at my place or meet you at yours, and and plus being a bloke as well, and there's nothing. It, it was a really good thing. So and I just say, where's the nearest coffee shop? I can meet you there at three o'clock or whatever. And so you always do it nice and out now, non-threatening. And. Uh, Oh, I went through a period about 10 or 15 years ago when I realised that I spoke too fast and also that um, I had a really loud voice, particularly going on Aboriginal communities. They all thought I was a policeman, or they called him a bully man, and they all thought I was a bully man on a camera, and yeah, you know, because they had short hair and all that. And I really had to change everything about myself, and I, had to, and I del deliberately worked on speaking more slowly and more clearly. Um, so you just got to move with it. I mean, that's a, a minuscule example of how much you guys have got to change and move with the times as well.